Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for starting your weekend with us at Bookish. We're the virtual program on authors, thinkers, and the literary life. And I'm Sam Dunn, the senior editor of premium content here at the Southern California News Group. Our sponsor tonight is the Sagerstrom Center for the Arts. And before we get going, here's a message to get us started. Hello, Bookish members. Sagerstrom Center for the Arts is presenting a fascinating new speaker series called In Conversation, featuring some of your favorite authors. Amy Tan, author of The Joy Luck Club and The Kitchen God's Wife, opens the series on January 23rd. The brilliant cultural commentator Fran Leibowitz brings her wit and wisdom on February 6th. And Eric Larson, author of The Splendid and the Vile, as well as The Devil in the White City, arrives on March 6th. Join us for fascinating discussions and an inside look into the creative minds of these best-selling authors. Three event packages start at only $60. Visit scfta.org today to purchase your tickets. Thanks again to the Sagerstrom Center for the Arts. And speaking of thanks, I want to say thank you to all of our Reader Reward subscribers for supporting our programs and to all of you who come back again and again. By the way, if you are a Reader Rewards member attending tonight, you're automatically entered to win a $50 gift certificate to our partner and one of our favorite independent bookstores in the LA area, Once Upon a Time. And if you're not a subscriber yet, well, why aren't you a subscriber yet? Go to scng.com forward slash subscribe to find your local paper. And that way you'll know all of the things we've got going on. And also, if you've missed our past programs, go to scng.com forward slash virtual programs and check them all out. Anyway, before we get started, let me remind you a couple things. Audience members are muted. But if you have questions, and we really hope you do, please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. And if you want to add a comment, just use the chat feature found there on your screen. This session is going to be videotaped, and a link is going to be sent to you so you can share or just revisit some of your favorite moments. It's also posted, again, at scng.com forward slash virtual events, and that's where you're going to be able to find all of our past shows, too. Now, the moment we have waited for, joining from... Bohemian splendor, blah, if I can get those words out, in Pasadena is our beloved host, writer and performer Sandra Singlow. You've heard her as a regular commentator on NPR's Morning Edition and on This American Life and Marketplace. She's also a contributing editor at The Atlantic and the author of seven books, including her most recent, The Mad Woman and the Roomba. And she's also got a new show, Adina Home Companion, coming up on October 30th. Hello, Sandra. Hello. Hello, she said, uh, starting her video. Hello, there I am with the strange late afternoon spots that are going on. I'd like to say it's a special Zoom filter, but it's just spots. So it's very MTV. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> well, it's so exciting. And I just want to mention with the Dina Home Companion that you just saw that takes place in Altadena, California. It's, it's the Dinas. Um, this time, <laughs> one of the, and we've had, you know, John Michael Higgins on and Mary Lou Henner. This time where it's called Halloween Adina, and we're going to have some members of the, something I'm a member of. It's called TACO, T-A-C-O, the Terrible Adult Chamber Orchestra. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so <laughs> all of us play, you know, at any level we come and play together. And I, I don't know if there are any of the readers that are out there or book lovers that have a clarinet collecting dust in your closet. It's T-A-C-O, TACO. Uh, you can go online if you ever want to come play with us. It's, it's a lot of fun. Gives new meaning to Taco Tuesday. But anyway, <laughs> we'll coming up. Uh, so, and also the, the other thing that we are in our second and oh, third yeah. day of blown out hair, because last night you and I were at Caltech, the Caltech yeah. presents behind the book event. Yes. And they have a fantastic book series too. They do. Caltech behind the book and you were the star last night. You guys can already check out that clip on you on YouTube. So look yeah. for it there. Yeah, behind the book. But today, 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 um, I, I mean, we have a wonderfully eclectic show. I'm really excited. No one can accuse us of being inside any box. First of all, we'll begin with a revisit with one of our favorite authors. And really, I want to say also adventure, Martin Dugard. He's well known for, Gar Gar did I say that right, Dugard? Dugard. Uh, Dugard. Dugard. Okay, I said it. He's sure. listening in. He can correct me. We had this whole discussion about what Bill calls him. Okay, Dugard. Okay, he's well known for co-writing, as you can hear, the Killing Cat and Killing Lincoln series with Bill O'Reilly. And his mesmerizing new book uh, on World War II, in the end, is Taking Berlin, mm -hmm. The Bloody Race to Defeat the Third Reich. 
It's so exciting. It's mesmerizing. Okay. And then secondly, we'll get to a personal favorite author of Lemony Snicket, a.k.a. Daniel Handler. Lemony Snicket, who has also been on our show. Yes, and remember, gentle viewers, you can revisit Lemony Snicket in our archives. And I'm doing this because he played the accordion and made us all dance along. It's hilarious, so do check it out. So anyway, he is a fan of the wonderful Michelle T. Dubbed from World War II to the fairy godmother of the millennial queer set by Vogue. Her memoir, Knocking Myself Up, A Memory of My Infertility, is both gripping and hilarious. And then, Samantha, in yeah. the spirit of true eclecticness, in Act 3, you are stepping in as guest interviewer. I worry for my job security. I don't think you have to worry, but uh, Tony, as I call him, yes, <sighs> make you fall in love with books if you weren't already. Anyway, listen, let's get to it. I'm getting out of here. Okay, Anthony Doerr. Okay, good. All right, so... We'll begin with Martin Dugard, the 30-second download. Martin Dugard is the number one New York Times bestselling author and historian who has written on topics ranging from presidents to Egyptian pharaohs. Known for his fondness for adventure, he's also a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and has flown around the world at twice the speed of sound. He is co-author with Bill O'Reilly, as I mentioned, of the popular Killing series, and I should say, it is the most successful nonfiction series in publishing history, with more than 12 million copies sold. Other acclaimed works including, include Into Africa, The Explorers, The Murder of King Tut, and To Be a Runner. Author of the national bestseller, Taking Paris, The Epic Battle for the City of Lights, fantastic titles, which we talked about exactly one year ago. The follow-up just out is Taking Berlin, The Bloody Race to Defeat the Third Reich. Welcome, Martin. Wait, there, huzzah, I'm here. Huzzah, it's so great to see you in front of that famous world map that I love so much. The uh, and I love walking to my office and looking at it every day. It's, it makes me happy. Yes, okay. So starting actually at the end of your fascinating new book and the acknowledgments, which I, 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 I loved, you, you wrote, it took me a while to break up with taking Paris as all authors must do when moving from one beloved project to the next and find the voice for taking Berlin. Can you unpack that a little bit for our viewers to set the stage for how you created taking Paris and how you transitioned? Yeah, sure. Um, well, so, you know, my, my writing career began, you know, I, I, was, I was that guy with a, with a crappy corporate job who wanted to bust out and began doing magazine work on the side and worked my way up and finally got fired and convinced my wife to let me, you know, take a flyer on the writing thing. And, and that was, you know, back in 1994. Um, and so I did my own voice, you know, and I moved into books in about 1998. And I did my own thing until I got a call from an agent asking if I would work with Bill on these books. And um, and I love the fact that I could just write history all over the map. But the thing about that, that great partnership, you know, to 2009 to 2021, 2022, was that everything that I wrote inevitably, inevitably went into Bill's voice, which is just how a partnership works. And if you collaborate as part of the package, you know, you get to get to cash the check, but you also have to kind of subjugate your own, your own voice. And so with Taking Paris, it was the first time in you know, like a dozen years, I've really been able to let my heart soar and sing and take some chances with the words and, you know, mess some stuff around. And I loved it. And I got happy. I used to get teary explaining to people like, this makes me so happy. And they didn't, people who don't understand the written word didn't get why that made me so happy. But if you put together a great sentence, it just makes your day. And so anyway, I loved it. And then, then we got, we came up with the sequel, which was the last you know, nine months of World War II, which is actually even more exciting. But, um, you know, it was like, a, it was just like this lover I couldn't forget. And so I, I kind of, you know, you know, moped and whined about, you know, missing taking Paris when I saw my, also I realized I had a, de <laughs> had a deadline. Um, and I'll, I also had a really great topic, you know, and it was a, it was a, it was a kind of an audacious topic. I didn't want to write about something as big as D-Day because it had been done so much. And I, I didn't want to tackle a lot of these things that were so epic that have been told so many times. And so I finally started looking for the people within the stories and, and focusing on the, the individuals instead of the battles. And it really, once that happened, it just, it just took off. Is that what you mean by when you meant finding the voice? for this book that is different than Taking Paris. Is that what you mean? The, the it's, it's different. You know, with, with Paris, I was just trying to be, 
it was a little bit like a, you know, like a teenager who's trying to, you know, break away a little bit and just you know, have people say, oh, this doesn't sound like the killing books. You know, people, it's got the same present tense. And I, I tell people, if you like the killing books, you're going to love the taking series because it has all those things. It has the, the first person stuff, but it has a really rich detail. And I love research. I love going down the rabbit hole and finding really, really cool things to, to kind of slide into the book that people might never have known. But at the same time, it was such an, I don't want to say it was abrasive, but it was so startlingly different. I wanted to get find something a little bit smoother and a little bit more luxurious, for lack of a better word, something, something richer, something that really brought people into those moments as, as individuals instead of just being stylistic. I wanted people to feel like they were in the moment. Yeah, and I, I think that the research that you do is so fun. I never knew where um, flipping the bird came from. I'm not going to make <laughs> the bit, gesture. Right? I know, but like, it's like, <laughs> I did not know that. And yeah. Roger, why they say Roger at the end of yeah. communications and stuff like that. But, but I think it's also, you do have an amazing ability, and many reviewers have pointed this out, of to, to sort of, uh, let, it's very filmic, and you kind of go big picture to small picture. And I remember there's a story of like a three-year-old girl that sleep it and, and then it's connected to oh. this explosion it, it is really mesmerizing and it does go from person to person I mean speaking of research I think that you also wrote that as opposed to it in taking Paris which you wrote during COVID taking Berlin yeah. that was lifted so that was different right it was different you know um so back in my journalist days I covered the Tour de France for 10 years so I traveled all around France so Taking Paris was kind of written from my notes from those days. And I haven't been to the tour since 2009. So those are very old notes. So uh, with COVID, you know, I, you know, I still had great notes and I still had great memories and vivid recollections. But at the same time, to go visit places anew and uh, go to places I'd never been before, like, you know, Nijmegen and Holland and the River Wall, where the great market garden scenes take place, and even go back to the Omaha beaches, which I hadn't seen in 20 years and really just stand there and smell the air and really feel, um, you know, be able to get the sweep of what you're seeing and imagine people, you know, fighting and, and shooting back and just, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. And some of the colors that you describe in the wood, I mean, it's very painterly. It, it's very, it's very sensory yeah. when you read it. It's really fantastic. Um, well, a couple of things, I mean, uh, General George S. Patton is such a colorful, indelible character in your books. I mean, his one-liners alone, uh, not all can be repeated on a family show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Like like blank through a goose, I think was one. Yeah. Do, do you get, is it a special charge of writing about him? Is it fun? I mean, Churchill is another great character. It's I mean, fun. Well, you know, you know, when you write history, you kind of fall in love with these dead people and you know, because you're, you're reading about them and you, and you know their life so well, you know, you know what they like to eat, you know, how they schedule their day and all this stuff. And so you kind of delight in these people and you want to bring a richness to them. And like you said before about being cinematic, I love people to feel like they're watching, they're reading a movie, you know, they're, they're in this thing. And that's why the present tense is something I really favor. Um, but people, people like Patton, um, I mean, how can you not love Pat? He's so larger than life, and he's he's actually such a, you know, I wouldn't say a fallen character, but he was so troubled in his personal life, but he was so in his moment as a general. Uh, I think with this book, what I loved most was meeting Martha Gellhorn, um, and I knew her name before, and I knew the name of General James Gavin before, and I kind of knew that they had an affair, but when you think of Martha Gellhorn, you think of... Um, just the third wife of Ernest Hemingway. And it's this little hole that she's, this little cage that she's been put in. And then you read her, her writing, her journalism is exceptional. And she's much better as a journalist than Hemingway. Her, you know, Hemingway's novels are better than hers, but her journalism is exceptional and her courage. You know, whenever I do these books, um, I like to, to make sure that we have strong women in there. Um, just, I think that's my wife talking to me, just making sure that we, but you, you kind of lose half the audience if, if you don't find women's stories. And, you know, taking Paris, we had a, you know, some great strong nurses. Yeah, Virginia we, Hall, the one-legged British spy. Amazing. Yeah, was she amazing? But then when, um, when I found Gellhorn, I just, 
I just loved her. As a matter of fact, even after the book was over, my wife and I went to London. I made a point to go to her flat and kind of sit on her stoop. And <laughs> it was kind of funny because the guy who owns the place came home at the end of the day and we're sitting there and he goes, can I help you? I go, uh, we're just trying to get out of the rain, but I just wanted to like sit where Martha Gellhorn sat, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and she was wonderful in her affair with Gavin. And a great story is that if you read the biographies of Gellhorn, um, a lot of the dates in, in their, their chronology are unknown. People guessed at them. And we're literally just before the book went into production, somebody sent me a copy of, of Gavin's unpublished World War II journals, and which had all the exact dates and all the fights they had and all the, you know, where they met in their initial stuff. And it was just, it just blew it up. It, for me, it just, it was that moment where you could really get closer to the characters. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the, the, the women characters, they have to navigate around sort of a male-dominated world, so it makes yeah. their stories really interesting and really strong. Um, I mean, there's so many, uh, and uh, there, there's so much in this book that will be fascinating for people to read, um, you know, Erwin, Erwin Rommel's chap is like yeah. mind-blowing, stuff that you wouldn't know, and that gives real humanity to the German side in a certain way. Um, I think, well, two, two things in, in terms of moving forward, I mean, as you describe in your afterward, there are resonances from the end of World War II to this day, particularly with Russia. I wonder right. if you can you can describe that a little bit for our audience, where Russia was then and, and how it resonates now. Well, you know, Russia, historic, matter of fact, I just finished reading this fascinating story about uh, the Vikings, and I can't remember the name of the author. It's a beautiful book. But she was talking, the, the author was talking about um, this, this tribe called the Rus, and there was this very dominant tribe back in the Viking days. We're talking about, you know, 2,000 years ago. And it's the same people now. It's just, it's just a, it's a culture that, um, is bent on conquest and power and, and, not, and having borders so that people can infringe upon their territory. And the same things that Stalin was doing during World War II are the same things that Putin was doing. And it's just like with uh, the, the Gavin Journal, you know, I wouldn't say by luck or by coincidence, you know, Putin chose to invade Ukraine just as I was finishing the book. And I had to put that in the back of the book because um, I just found it's, I don't know, you, you, when you write history, you get so close to it, you can touch it, you can feel it, and there's a sense of outrage, but you say, okay, that happened 70 years ago, that's never going to happen again, so when it happens again in my lifetime, because I'm writing a book about it, I felt like I had to make sure that got in the back of the book. And finally, um, I, I, I would want to have people directed to you, this great piece that you wrote about Queen Elizabeth, or the late Queen Elizabeth, yeah. and how World War II form her in a way. Can you, can you just say a word or two about that? Yeah, no, real quick. What happened was, um, you know, publicists always want to get you to do something to help promote the book. And they were saying, oh, write something about Elizabeth. Well, what happened was um, my wife, I was going to Hawaii on a business trip to do research for a new book, um, just as my, I booked it two months ago, but then the queen died. And so it worked out really well. So in addition to doing all the research things you do, like going to museums and I flew in a Spitfire, which is super cool. Um, my wife and I stood in that queue to, to um, pay, res pay respects to the queen. It was, we spent eight hours there. It was such a great historical moment to watch, you know, you know walk past the catafalque. And I, I bowed, my wife curtsied, it was spectacular. But um, so that was it, like, I literally the next day, I got a thing from the publicist saying, can you write something about the queen perhaps? I go, I can write everything about the queen. But, but the thing was, you know, uh, Buckingham Palace got bombed. And you can just see this Dornier bomber skimming low over the mall, just going straight for that, that famous balcony right in front. And, um, and I'm going to actually put that, it's going to be my next book. <laughs> I, like, <laughs> I like the story so much, I'm going to steal it and build on it because it's just this great moment. You have this, this teenage girl, she's never been in the public eye before, and all of a sudden she's thrust in, into it because her dad knows she's going to be queen and says, look, you have to not just endure this. I want you to go on the on BBC and I want you to talk to the British people. And I want you to encourage people your age to, to kind of carry on throughout the war. Yeah, it was great. You know, it's just, just one of those things that you, um, you know, you, you dig, you tiptoe into the research and you think you know a little bit, but then when you know the whole story, it just, it kind of uplifts you. I think as a writer, it's, it's those things that at the end of the day that make you glad you're a writer because you can find moments throughout history and, 
they carry you, and especially when you, you dig into a little bit deeper. It's, I, it, for me, it's fascinating. Something for us to look forward to in the next book of yours also. So um, thank you so much for visiting with us. It's always a delight to talk to you. Um, Martin Dugard, his fast-paced new historical narrative, Taking Berlin, The Bloody Race to Defeat the Third Reich, is out now. Get it. You'll love it. Sandra, I'm a big fan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, great to talk to you. A pleasure. We'll see you again soon, we hope. All right. Take care. Thanks. All right. Next up, we have Michelle T, the 30-second download. And yes, from World War II to I love that cover. <laughs> Michelle T is the author of over a dozen books, including the cult classic Valencia, illustrated Rent Girl, and speculative memoir, Black Wave. She's won awards from the Guggenheim Land, the Literary and Rana Jaffe Foundations, Pan America in Pan America. T's cultural interventions, and we will touch on that, include brainstorming the international phenomenon Drag Queen Story Hour, co-creating the Sister Spit queer literary performance tours. I think I got a P hoodie from that one time. And being founding member at Radar Productions, a Bay Area literary organization. She's also held the imprint Sister Spit books at City Lights Publishers and Amethyst Editions at the Feminist Press. This is fun. She produces and hosts, hosts the Your Magic podcast, wherein she reads tarot cards for Roxanne Gay, Alexander Cheek, Phoebe Bridgers, and other artists. Her latest memoir, and they're all fantastic, is Knocking Myself Up, a memoir of my infertility. Welcome, Michelle T. Thank you. Oh my God, it's so nice to see you. And when you made that little comment about having bought uh, some merchandise at a Sister Spit show, I'm like, I feel like I've had you it's in my life for so long. And I've been and, and I've been a fan of yours since we were talking about like the Chelsea Whistle, which I rave reviewed in the New York Times. Thank you very much. Thank and you very much. It was my first <laughs> uh, New York Times review ever, and it really blew my mind. And I learned about it when I was actually visiting Chelsea, which is not a very rare occurrence in my life. But I had a little thing in Chelsea, and someone said, "Did you see you were in the New York Times today?" And it really, really was a big deal. So one thing that connects the, that book, actually, and this is your fantastic voice, voiciness, voice. And we just talked about voice with Martin in, in a, mm -hmm. another context. So just for people who are newcomers to your work, I thought I would just read a couple of sentences from the beginning, and then maybe you can expand. Okay. Sure. So, um, and, and it's from, it, when I set out to try to knock myself up, and just that word phrase is, is so emblematic of, of how you were, um, I pledge not to be precious about it. Um, I would resist, resist what the culture expects, expects of people choosing to produce. I wanted to keep potential motherhood in its proper place, life-changing and magical, sure, but also incredibly common. Yes, the stakes become higher, but a sense of irreverence, deep, sometimes macabre humor, uh, a challenging eye, a gossipy tone, these are things I wanted to reflect in this journey to help humanize it, wrench it away from the contemporary culture of precious mommyhood into something more relatable and accessible. Okay, so what do you mean by, I'll just say there, the contemporary culture of precious mommyhood? What is that to you? Well, I mean, I think at this point, there actually is so many um, amazing, strong, like, voices that of, of people who've had kids that um, are kind of like, kind of take the peak. Can I, can I swear? Is piss even a swear? You know, take the piss out of it a little bit. And, and it's not just like, so just like, oh my, you know, my, I'm a mother. I don't know. Like I was, I was certainly reacting against my own sense that I didn't, that I didn't feel like I could fit into an idea of motherhood as I've always seen it, you know, in life. Um, I mean, that's a June like, Cleaver kind of. The I mean, I mean, June Cleaver is really dated, but we have our own June Cleavers now, you know, they're just like every, they're just dressing their babies in bamboo, you know, <laughs> organic onesies and just like make, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's like that. And I love that. I love an organic bamboo onesie too, but it just seems like it's just like one sort of like, this is how you do it you know, back in the June Cleaver days. And then it's just, but it's still like, this is how you do it, you know? And I, I kind of understand it's so nerve wracking to suddenly be responsible for a little thing that can't even hold its damn head up. You know, it's like, it's a lot. And so I understand why people cling to, you know, best practices and get sort of fussy and precious about it, but I'm just not like that. I had my baby too late in life. 
to, oh, you, know, and, you know what I mean? And, yeah, I and just, to set I up the story a little, I think it's fascinating because can, can you paint a picture of yourself at age 40 mm -hmm. of just narratively where you are at the moment you decide to go on this journey just to get. Yeah, I'm 40 out. years old. Uh, I'm like 10 years sober. Uh, I realized that everyone that I date tends to be a scrub. And so I decided not to date anymore. Um, <laughs> I'm running a queer literary nonprofit in San Francisco that shockingly has become very successful. I'm living in my own apartment and I'm like making a living wage for the first time in my life. And I, I still don't have health insurance, you know, but, um, but there's a lot of great free clinics in San Francisco. And I just decided that I think I wanted to have a baby. And I kind of looked into it. it. It sort of was like a lark, almost like a joke at first, but then it just kept sitting with me. And when I sort of did the Google of like, you know, what does a 40 year old woman's eggs look like? I saw the bad news and started crying and it really washed away my ambivalence. I had been so ambivalent about it. I was like, maybe it'd be amazing. Maybe it would ruin my life. I don't know. But seeing, having it seem like it was somehow taken away from me made me feel like, oh, but I, I do want it. And so that was really illuminating and great. And I went forth sending really awkward emails to all the gay guys that I know being like, can I have some of your sperm? <laughs> like, no girl, you can't. <laughs> well, which is part of the community uh, that you, you, you talk about. And I, I think there's a little bit in here because we've known each other a long time of that sometimes there, there are some writers that say, don't ever be a mother because that will take away your creativity. And I think- Well, a lot of people said that to me. Right. And it sort of seemed the opposite. It sort of expanded your emotions and you know, it, it, it seemed like that in this particular journey. Yeah, it didn't, it's like, doesn't take away your writing. I mean, you know, you're, you're a mom. I mean, it, what it, what it does do is make it harder to find the time. Right. But I feel like I've always been pretty good at, at finding those nooks and crannies, you know, like having started writing when I, you know, really seriously, when I was younger and always working these jobs and I was always just finding little ways to, you know, unwork and just like write on the job and stuff. And so it was sort of like, I had to let go of this idea that, Oh, in order to be productive, I need five quiet hours stretched out before me. You know, it's like, no, if you have an hour, you can actually make progress. You can do something and you, you just got to snag it. You got to grab it. So, so, and, and I think the infertility journey, I mean, it is, it is quite um, fascinating and almost harrowing some of the drugs that you have to take and fertility and this, that. And I think that you mentioned that you're 10 years sober, which I think resonates really powerfully here and that you're on you know, when you said you were unmedicated, in the years that you were unmedicated, you would just cry in the bathroom for four hours at a time. So now you're on, I think it's select antidepressants to manage your mood, and then you have to go off them, right? Can you talk about that a little bit? I was so wackadoodle. It was not good. Yeah, you know, I, I got off of it because I was hoping I'd get pregnant, and I didn't want to you know, have it going into the baby and all this stuff. And so for the first round, the first couple of rounds of, um, you know, it takes a million, I mean, some people get really lucky. It took me three tries to actually get pregnant and keep the baby, you know, um, and actually have a baby. But the first couple of times I was not medicated and it, you know, I tried to give myself my progesterone shot in my butt and just like burst into tears. I got in a crazy fight with, um, I like was too hormonal and sobbing to make it to a you know, a, a bookstore event that I was supposed to be at. Also, my ride canceled on me. There was a lot going on. But <laughs> the person from the bookstore tweeted about it and they were like, so disappointing when authors let down their fans. And I was like, oh my God, you know? And I ended up finding this person and like writing them and just being like, I have to shoot progesterone straight into my ass, Nancy. I don't know what that feels like to you, but it feels like shooting straight PMS into my butt. You know, it was like, I was like, I was really unhinged and starting, you know, internet fights. So as it happened, Prozac, a small dose of it has actually been seen, been proven to be like fine for a pregnant woman and a nursing woman. So um, I, I, I did it. I ate that Prozac and the yeah, internet and was a happier place for it. And yeah, and, and I think that it is, it's a little bit of perils of Pauline, like to read this book, but it is so hilarious, so human. And I think probably the only way that you got through it was, was I was thinking of two things. One is your sense of humor in the darkest moments, what you, what you call things and the language that you invent around this stuff. It's so human, it's hilarious, but I think it's also your community. 
like uh, the queer community like supports you in so many ways can you and it, it seems like it's such a unique and I don't want to say special because that's what, but it's a unique community. It is special. I, it, yeah, it, it is. is special. It is. It's very special. Yes. Well, honestly, I, one of the most special things I think that I got from my queer community and from being queer is that, you know, there is not a premium placed on becoming a parent, you know, and there's, there's like a, there's a shadow side to that too, that I experienced when I tried, you know, when I made this decision, but just knowing that like, you know, all around me, are amazing. These are my amazing friends doing amazing things all the time. Nobody has any kids. Nobody wants any kids. And it's like, I know that if this experiment fails and I'm not able to have a baby, like I, it's not like the end of the world. And I, and I think that there's a lot of people who are raised, I think, with this expectation and they internalize it. And, and it gets confusing because maybe you want it also, but you know, I think the stakes maybe feel a lot higher for people who, who aren't queer. I don't want to say that as a blanket statement, but for me, it was really connected to my queerness that I knew I had a really amazing life that was going to go on with or without a kid. And, you know, that, that whether or not I had a child wasn't going to be necessarily the defining moment of my life. You know, I was going to have a lot of defining moments. Yeah. And it, again, the sense of humor and the, the characters and the, the, the bowls and the, your, <laughs> and, spe and, and speaking of drag queens yeah. and your, your first sperm donor, who is a drag queen. Okay. I don't know if we could pivot for just a moment about and to talk to us about Drag Queen Story Hour that you yeah just, well they just, are a little connected um, yeah. they're actually very connected uh, Drag Queen Story Hour was an idea that I had um, when I was working at my queer nonprofit Radar Productions in San Francisco and I was about to move to LA but I had one more grant I had to kind of brainstorm and I had to come up with a suite of programming for the Castro right? The famous gay neighborhood in San Francisco. And I had only just been to the library there, the Harvey Milk Branch Library. And I had connections there. I had done events there, but I'd just been there for a story time with my baby because I had my baby now. And I'd been to a few story times at libraries and goddess bless the librarians. I don't think <laughs> anything against the library. I mean, a story hour in general is just kind of like mind numbing for an adult, right? It just is. And so I was like, God, you know, I had just having a baby, you know, at, in my 40s when I'd been part of queer nightlife and queer art since my 20s, suddenly I'm in these really boring environments. You know, they're so straight and they just are so dull. And I'm like, how could we queer this up? Like, what would make this more fun for me? Maybe even more fun for the kids, like just more fun, more joy, more, you know, fantasticness. And I thought, oh my God, drag queens should be here reading stories to kids. And it was like 2015 that I thought of this and we were having this boom of progressive kids literature, right? We were having like A is for activist and, you know, happy punks one, two, three, and like all these great, great books were coming out. I think rad American women had come out by then. And I was like, Oh, this is great. Well, they'll read all these really cool books, drag Queens, blah, wrote the grant, got the grant, moved to LA. My successor, uh, Julian Delgado Lopera, um, kind of was the one who actually put it into practice with a drag queen Persia. And it was immediately a huge hit. And I wasn't surprised. It, I knew it was a really good idea, but I was, I didn't know it would become like a global sensation. And I sure as hell didn't know that like proud boys would come out of the woodwork and start like terrorizing, you know, children in our libraries around the country. Oh. Like, everything that has happened has been so wild, you know? And at first when there was, some rumblings, you know, from the right wing about it. People were letting me know. And I'm like, I've been gay for so long. Like there's, these jerks are always like saying something dumb. You know what I mean? Like, if, if, yeah, of course they don't like drag queens reading to kids. Like, duh, of course, they don't like that. We know that, who cares? Carry on. But I didn't realize that they would be such, so, so, so butthurt about it, that they would become like, that, that it would become like their their cause, you know? So yeah. that's been really, that's been very, very wild to, to, to witness. Well, overall, I wish we had more time, but overall you bring joy. You bring joy, you bring fabulousness and you bring magic and your book is fantastic. And thank you so much. Thank you really so much like for coming and chatting with us. It's Michelle T. Her latest, newest memoir is Knocking Myself Up. A memoir of my infertility. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Samantha. Come back, Michelle. Come back. Anytime. Come back. Anytime. We'll take you up on that. Sorry, we have to move on. Bye, Bye you guys. I'm going to take myself off screen and watch you. Oh, oh well, wow. This is a first. Um, well, 
now it is my pleasure to do the my first probably last uh 30 second download on anthony door and his novel made a splash all the light we cannot see it won the pulitzer prize for fiction and the andrew carnegie medal for excellence in fiction all in 2015. his next book cloud cuckoo land was a finalist for the 2021 national book award and novel of the year in the british book awards you're likely going to recognize his titles even if you haven't read them because they've topped bestseller list around the country for months and months and months what you might not know, though, is that he is also the author of the story collections, The Shell Collector and The Memory Wall, and a memoir, Four Seasons in Rome, and another novel about grace. And his short stories and essays have won, get this, five O. Henry prizes, and his work has been translated into over 40 languages. Let's just get straight to the clip. Julie, please roll it for us. Welcome, Tony. <laughs> Hi, Samantha. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, it's our pleasure. Listen, many of the people in the audience are going to know you from all the light we cannot see. And, and that, for the three people in the room remaining who haven't read it, is an interweaving tale of the blind French girl Marie Lore and Werner, a young man in Germany, and how their lives intersect through the drama and, of course, the horror of World War II. But, dude, you know, you really up the ante in cloud cuckoo land. Um, and so for those of, of, of our audience who haven't yet become acquainted with a book, you've got five protagonists in the past, the present, and the future. You've got Anna and Omir um, on opposite sides of the city walls during the siege of Constantinople in the 1400s. You've got the teenage eco-warrior Seymour and the octogenarian Zeno, whose lives collide in a public library in present-day Idaho, which I think is where you live, right? Yeah. And, and then we've got Constance, who is on what seems to be an interstellar spaceship bound for another planet, and that's decades in the future. And yet, wait, all of those stories wrap around another story that connects them all, which is an ancient book written in Greece about a character who longs to be turned into a bird so to, that he can fly up to this utopian paradise in the sky. And I am just wondering, you know, with such a rich tapestry, what came first for you? I mean, you even invented the Greek tale at the story's core. So how do you begin? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Samantha. Great summary. It's a hard book to summarize. <laughs> uh, it started with All the Light We Kind of See. About, I don't know, 65, 60% of that book is set in a little seaside town in Brittany, France called Saint-Malo. It's got about 1.6 kilometers of ancient, well, medieval walls around it. And it formed this tiny little pearl in this strain of uh, of fortifications called the Atlantic Wall that Hitler was trying to build to prevent an invasion from the Atlantic all the way down the coast of Belgium and France and the Franco-Spanish border. An enormous, it seems like totalitarians seem to love to try to build walls through the human right. history. Everything that I would read about the history of walls when I was preparing to write that book would mention the walls of Constantinople, something right. I knew nothing about. They stood for 1,100 years unbreached. They withstood uh, 23 sieges. People were bringing elephants trying to siege the city. There's Crumb the Bulgar. He's like drinking wine out of human skulls. Even his armies can't get through the walls. And they really, for the citizens of Byzantium, they really took on this almost supernatural power. They felt like the foundation stones had been laid by the mother of God herself. Yeah. I love to use my work as a way to kind of rectify my various ignorances. I will die ignorant of so many things, but I just fell in love with the idea of this old technology of human walls and how they allowed of course Constantinople accumulated insane wealth in a bunch of different ways you know gold there's like so much different spices and it was really the nexus of Europe and Asia slaves were human beings were being moved through there but as soon as I learned about book culture and the way the walls of Constantinople allowed the preservation of book culture as the last copies of Greek and Roman texts were decaying all around Europe and North Africa as Arab intellectual culture was rising. That, that was really a real repository of ancient wisdom preserved because of these libraries inside those walls so these books could be recopied by hand every couple hundred years. That's when I felt that like electrical feeling yeah. that you get when you're like, I think I've got something that can sustain a years-long project. Mm -hmm. So I was about 
what started was just Anna and Omir, the characters you mentioned. I have a girl inside the walls and a boy in the Ottoman army outside the walls. The 15th century was this amazing confluence of new technologies. The Europeans are adopting gunpowder from the Chinese, and the printing press is about to arrive on the scene. Gunpowder is enabling the uh, these you know huge cannons to be built to make this old technology of defensive walls obsolete. And then, of course, there's new navigational tools. So Europeans are sending people to discover, quote unquote, discover the new world. And in many ways, you could say they're sending people to infect people in the new world with diseases. Yeah. So this huge confluence of new technologies is really disrupting things in human history in the 15th century. And it felt so much like now to me that I started to think, I'm going to build a triptych. I'm going to show how an act of stewardship, saving one old copy of one very old book, might ricochet down through time and I'm gonna set. So then I moved from the 15th century to the present. And then I thought to really get the past, present and future feeling, I'm gonna take this big gulp of caffeine and see if I can be brave enough to also have one character about a third of the book set in the future. Totally speculative fiction. I, I love that. It was, yeah, triptych. I, I love I love that way to think about the book. Well, listen, you talked about uh, researching your ignorance and you you are a history major. That, at least that was your undergrad, right? Yeah. And, and the book is just so lush. I, I thought about the, the writing teacher, John Gardner's um, quote, the vivid and continuous dream in the reader's mind. And that was certainly true for this book and for, for your other as well. But I wondered, because you're, you're so adept at researching and because you have this insatiable curiosity, how do you know when you're when you're done with researching? And how do you know when you have fallen into that research rapture rather than you know writing? Great question, Samantha. I can tell you can relate for sure, because there often research can veer into procrastination for me. I'm like, oh, this is interesting, this is interesting, and then it's lunch, and I haven't added a single word to the project. Um, I find it's uh, it's a delicate balance because reading is so amazing. You follow this labyrinth of where one book sends you to the next book, and then you're like, oh, I want to see pictures of that. Let's see if there's any archaeological pictures in the 15th century. So often I find I've got to force myself back into the narrative that I'm writing to see what exactly it is I need. I think there's kind of a false uh, sense among a lot of beginning writers that you do all kinds of research, you finish that stage, like take a drink of water and then begin your writing. Yes. But often, you know, I'll have Anna, you know, reach down to whatever to the ground. And I'm like, I don't know what kind of shoes she would be wearing in the 15th century. So you're two sentences into your writing day and you're like, time to read about shoes and slippers and Byzantium. You know, she works in an embroidery house, so the few surviving examples of Byzantine embroidery are so amazing, and you wonder, like, what were these women's lives like before electricity, when you have to work by candlelight if it's dark or only by sunlight? You know, what did they work six days a week, it's turned, which it turns out they did? You know, how much chafing at this structure of this awful life that you're basically hunched over a needle and thread working with things as small as a grain of rice until your back fails or your eyesight fails. Uh, you know, so you're kind of fluctuating between imagination and research all the time. And just like you said, that John Gardner line, it both motivates me and haunts me all the time uh -huh. because uh -huh. you don't want to alienate a reader who knows more about a certain subject than you do. And so, because that breaks the dream for her. If she's an expert in Byzantine embroidery, you still want her to believe in this, this thing, this sure. dream that you're knitting for her. Uh -huh. So um, the anxiety of trying to get details right will often motivate me to keep sending me back in. I just am so worried a reader's going to abandon it. So I'm just always trying to cram as much as I can. I'm like, look how interesting this is. And look how interesting this is. And then later on revision, you realize I can't just keep handing tea leaves to the reader. I have to make a cup of tea. So sometimes yeah. you kind of filter out a lot of that fascinating research and just make sure story, stories primarily. You need to care about what's in these characters' hearts as much as what their rooms look like or what their wardrobes look like. Well, that's also what a good editor's for, right? I'm sure you relied on your editor for, for uh, some of that weeding. But listen, I wanted to ask you about this because I noticed that one of the things that the this novel shares with all the light we cannot see, besides its its beautiful research and its compelling action, is that there's a good portion of young characters, and they're all they're all resourceful and they all find hope, even in the worst of the worst situations and and I don't get the feeling in your work that anything happens by 
accident. So can you talk about those young characters and the choice you make to have them in the first place? Yeah, thanks so much, Samantha. Um, yeah, so All the Light We Can't See took me 10 years to write, and this one took me seven, and my kids are 18 now. I finished this when they were 17 years old. So I think part of it is that I was a parent for uh -huh. the entire journey of writing those two books. Um, uh, parenting, you know, as everybody, so many people know, like it removes you from the center of your life. Like all of our senses are always telling us you're the center of things. But as soon as you're like, you know, your feet hurt and your bladder's full, it just doesn't matter when the kids need something when they're little. Totally. I think uh, what I was trying to explore in Cloud Cuckoo Land is ideas about stewardship, uh, the ideas that we need to start imagining ourselves out of our here and now and in imagining like what is this place going to look like for our grandkids and how can we protect both the natural environment and human culture in a way that they can have rich and meaningful lives. And so um, I tried to somehow, I think I'm drawn to those young characters because A, they help you re-see the world in new ways. When you have a young character, everything is new. That when, when a young person falls in love, she feels like she's the first person in history to have fallen in love. And all those feelings are so new and powerful. And as we get older, habit sometimes encrusts those feelings. And we get to the point sometimes where we're not even fully paying attention to our day because habit's making everything so familiar. And the art I'm most drawn to is stuff that breaks away that incrustation that forms around our lives and lets us see the, the utter miracle of getting to be here at all. So sometimes young characters are a tool for me to kind of remind myself and hopefully the reader that it's an absolute miracle to be here, to be alive in this moment. We get to be here for such an incredibly short amount of time, even if we're so lucky and live eight or nine decades. Uh, you know, the earth is four and a half billion years old. So I, I think uh, I'm trying to always somehow use care, use young characters, I think, to renew the world and renew language in a way. I love that. I love that. And I love, too, that the book was dedicated to librarians um, then, now, and years to come. And it's really a love letter to them. And it's also a love letter to our own our own capacity to transmit stories from generation to generation, as I said at the beginning of, of this before we started recording, that I wish I had, I wish my mom were alive so I could share this book with her. Um, and you you mentioned that you spent seven years writing this book, but yet the amazing thing is it feels totally contemporary, like you ripped the the subjects right out of the headlines now. And, and that brought to my mind the question, what do you feel that literature can do that journalism can't. Oh, thanks, Samantha. Um, well, you know, the one of my friends who's a novelist, Jess Walter, a lot of people know oh, his beautiful Walter. ruins. He's the best. He told me, he's like, you can't break the news in a novel. And um, <laughs> he's right. You know, it takes a long time to get a novel published. A novel is really about asking questions. And so what... Um, what I try to do, although often, you know, my phone is an enemy of this because it's always blurping like another alert, like there's flooding <laughs> in Pakistan or something. And I'm always um, getting distracted by the kind of the up and down needle movements of the news. It's but Putin, I, today, by the way. But anyway, please go ahead. <laughs> exactly. So I think for me, I, I try to look at larger um, scale movements. For example, in researching this novel, I was so interested and comforted in a way to remember that so many different generations of human beings have believed that they live at the end of history. There's even a name for it called the end of history syndrome. The, the citizens of Constantinople in 1453 genuinely believed this was it. The Bible had predicted that this was the end of things. The Antichrist was at the gate and the time of, of men, of human beings on earth was at an end. You know, I think about my parents' stories about the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, yeah. this whole idea that they lived under the threat of it was all going to end. That really reassured me, especially as the pandemic started to pick up speed and American democracy was being questioned. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it feels like the end of things. But somehow human culture always seems to persist. And I find that kind of beautiful and interesting. So I wanted to ask questions about dystopia and utopia and, and apocalypse all throughout the novel. All the characters kind of live at a time when they feel like things are ending. But hopefully because the novel's taking on so much time, you, you come to remember like that, oh yeah. Uh, time, you know, human culture continues. And what's beautiful about human culture is that it survives the individual. 
And hopefully that makes us feel not small, but big that, you know, the whole role of a novel is like to celebrate the hugeness of an individual life and also to multiply it so that you, you feel its smallness at the same time. And I love that about literature. It makes me feel less alone. And hopefully the best literature also makes me comfortable with my death anxiety that, you know, you think <laughs> yeah. I can accept that I will go that, uh, you know, you, like your mom, you're in a chain of generations. And when it comes time for us to leave the earth, hopefully we can be a slightly more at peace with it because of our engagement with literature throughout our lives. I love that. I love that, Tony. Let, let, well, you know, we're almost out of time. I could talk to you forever, but I just have to ask you, listen, you won the Pulitzer. Uh, you have more accolades than, I, than my arm. Uh, and then a friend of mine, I saw a beautiful quote that both of your books, uh, we've written more than these two, but the, the two novels, All the Light We Cannot See, excuse me, <clears throat> and Cloud Cuckoo Land are considered by some critics to be among the greatest achievements in American literature in the past few decades. My gosh. Okay. So do you, what do you do with that when you're writing? Do you think about that? Do you say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm Anthony Doerr. I can do this today. How do you relate to that? No, no, I feel the opposite. Like if I get to like the a four star Sudoku in an airline magazine and I can't finish it, all I hear is like Pulitzer Prize winner <laughs> fails again. You know, like that, that stuff is of course one, it's wonderful to have readers, but I know so well that there are just utterly beautiful books that disappear really quickly and that so much of it is just chance and the real pleasure and joy in life is making stuff and, and spending time manipulating, in my case, ma manipulating sentences and words. You know, that's what you and I love to do. And But it's fine if you love to manipulate paint or just play around with music on a guitar or on a harp or just quilt. Making these things, making your castles in the sky, that's where meaning and joy comes from, not uh, tethering yourself to how things are received. So of course we can all fall victim to like, oh, I hope more people like this, or I hope critics say something nice about it. But ultimately, you know, going for a walk with your kids or seeing the sun come down through the trees and then spending time every day trying to make something, that's what gives your life meaning. And um, so trying not to attach yourself to results, I think is the answer to living a, a kind of a happier life. I love that. I will keep your words. And also I have to say, I mean, I just love this book so much. What are you noodling on now? Are you noodling on anything? Will you tell us? Uh, yeah. I, I, unfortunately, I won't go into too many specifics because sometimes these things will, but I've got three projects. So you can picture like three house plants with just one little sure. shoot up and I try <laughs> to water them as much as I can. And you start to feel that, like that electric feeling that I described earlier when I started thinking about book culture in Constantinople. Once you catch that thing because you need that level of interest and enthusiasm to carry you through those low days when you're like why did I get interested in this again there's so many moments and with all the light we cannot see that I just thought I'm never going to finish this I don't know enough to write this book but my interest in radio and children during war was was what compelled me through those days so I'm looking in each of these three flower pots for that thing, that electric feeling, that lightning that's in the soil. And you're like, okay, I think I've got enough to compel me through all those anxious days when you're not sure you can keep pushing. Well, we wish you well. We can't wait to read what's next. And everybody, for those of you who haven't read it, Cloud Cuckoo Land, Anthony Doerr, thank you so much. Come back, please. <laughs> Thanks, Samantha. Thank you so much for having me. It's our pleasure. Well, thanks everybody for, for listening through that. Sorry about the video skipping, but oh well, the audio worked. Oh, it was so fantastic. And um, he's so, if only he weren't so shy and uncommunicative. <laughs> oh, I mean, it, it just made me want to go and write a 600 page. No, I mean, he is, he's amazing. Thank and you, you are a fantastic interviewer, I gotta say. So thank I, you, my sister. Yeah. Thank you, my sister. And everybody, everybody today, I hope, was inspiring. I felt that they were inspiring. I felt that you're inspiring as always. And thanks. Oh, everybody. And I sort of like the World War II and then the parenting thing. And then at the end, weaving of all these things, it kind of was eclectic, but really worked. Isn't it funny how these themes is kind of coalesce, even though we don't plan it necessarily, or you don't plan it necessarily? Yeah. Anyway, listen, thank you, my sister. Thank you, Sandra, for bringing your brilliance. And thank you, Julie. 
Corlett for being the, the Oz behind the curtain. And thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Martin. And of course, Tony. Um, listen, people, don't forget the books uh, uh, by to, by then. Sure, now I can't talk. Don't forget the books by tonight's authors are available at Once Upon a Time. And, before. and thank you, Meredith Meredith, by the way, who's saying some nice comments in the chat. And Kathleen oh, Weber and Christina Weber and uh, Deborah Moss, Jay Venta. Okay, and Christine Eifert, thank you for chiming in and we love seeing you always. And Carrie Jones. We do, we do. It. Well, listen, please come back, you guys. We'll be back next month. But but meanwhile, you don't have to wait that long for great content about authors. Please sign up for our book pages newsletter, which is done by our books editor. And Stephanie Eric. Ross, sorry. Stephanie, oh, Stephanie Ross. Hi, Stephanie Ross. And Bob Koenig. <laughs> Cooper, sorry. <laughs> wait, I've got my spiel here. And I'm subscribing to our papers for more book news anyway. And, and if you have thoughts from today, and I hope you do, um, send us an email at events at scng.com. Next month, you and I will be back here uh, for another wonderful episode of Bookish. And once again, thank you, Center. Bleh. Now I'm forgetting how to speak. Thank you, Segerstrom Center for the Arts, for sponsoring tonight's program. And everybody, take care. They are the best. Take care, everybody. Have a great uh, weekend and we'll see you next time.